We are live. Kelly. Tune in, everybody. This is the Unsigned Show. We are the Unsigned, those artists, musicians, and industry professionals who are not waiting for a record deal to do it for us. I've got Kelly Hunt live right now on Unsigned. Kelly, what's up? Ah, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. We were talking in the sound check. You got called out by Under the Live Oak Tree, an amazing quad, quad, quad quartet. Is it a quartet? Are they? Do you call it that in bluegrass? Creations, yeah. They do trio stuff and quartet stuff on a big oak tree, yeah. They're awesome. Oh, joke. I always say live oak tree. Well, <laughs> live oak. well we, we went through this actually in, in their episode. Um, there's a bank. There's a bank here in town called Live Oak. <laughs> and so I just keep thinking under the live oak tree. Under the big oak tree. We want a big oak it's tree. A it's a big live oak. Yeah, we don't care if it's alive or dead. We just need it to be big, under the big oak tree. But anyway, yeah, those those guys are cool. So they called you out, and now you're here on Unsigned to share your music and inspiration. Um, how do you know those guys, though? So I live in Kansas City. They're in, in St. Joe, which is like an hour away, and they reached out to me it's like a, a, over a year ago. Um, shortly after, a couple years ago, they were releasing their – uh, album and they reached out to me to do some opening slots for their CD release, which was awesome. And then we've done a couple of collaborations since then. They do um, the series where they they have a holiday series, so it's a bunch of Christmas and Hanukkah and like holiday music. So we collaborated on that last year and just hit it off. Um, our styles are very compatible and they're just really good people. So. Yeah. So so you're in Kansas City. Is that mm -hmm. where you grew up? No, I'm actually from uh, Memphis, Tennessee, born and raised, but my mom is from Kansas City, and I moved here three years ago, um, and I have a bunch of family here, and it's kind of my home away from home. That's why I live in Reno, is I have a bunch of family here. I, I, I would, like, why else Reno? There's no other reason for me. Um, <laughs> no, really. I, in fact, when I moved here, I had no idea music was, like, even, like, Thing here i mean I, I knew it had a history in, in jazz and stuff but i didn't know that there was this americana full group scene until i moved here and i had no like i didn't i moved here for a job in graphic design i didn't even move here for music or thinking i'd do music oh we're we're gonna have to talk about the graphic design too because what what i found about unsigned guests is they are multi-talented and you almost have to be if you're scrapping it out in in music especially independently these days you uh, you have to you have to be diverse. I want to know though about the Kansas City vibe. So let me let me set this up for you, okay? Because I've lived a couple, I've lived actually a lot of different places in my life, and every city seems to have its own vibe, okay? Yeah. So when I lived in, I was just telling this story at a party the other night. Um, uh, it was it was one of these parties like everybody was spiritual, you know, and it's like the food the food wasn't just food. The food was like nourishment man and it had to come from somewhere and it had the food had to have a story to it and it was like one of those parties and there was a bonfire and everything so we're, we're Actually, there was a bonfire yeah oh yeah oh yeah and 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 she said she told me bring my guitar so i did that thinking it was going to be like a kumbaya circle right mm -hmm. and instead it was just me basically doing a set there which i don't mind because she's a friend but like i just I didn't think I was going to have that much attention on me that night. Yeah. And so like, I just wasn't in that space and it, it, it wasn't bad or anything. It, it was just kind of like, once I sat down with the guitar, I realized I think I'm the only person who plays guitar right now. Who's, <laughs> who's at this party. So, so when I you're ready to like relax and have a good time and then suddenly you're on stage. Yeah, yeah, and and it was just, it was, it, yeah, exactly. And it was all acoustic and the, and the campfires blowing in my face. So, so I got all that smoke in my face. So I have to close my eyes while I'm singing because it's burning my eyes. <laughs> it was, I'm making it sound terrible. It was actually a lot of fun. It's a live performance. You never know what you're going to get. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was talking to these people because I used to live in Santa Barbara. And I was telling them in Santa Barbara, if you ask anybody, almost anybody, why are you in Santa Barbara? They almost universally answer, because I want to be here. I love living in Santa Barbara. It's a great place to live, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think the reason for that is almost anywhere else in the country is like easier or less expensive to live. And, and so if you don't want to be there, there's a lot of other options that you could be, that you could, yeah. you know, you could be perfectly fine. So everybody who's there wants to be there. A lot of people are just scraping by, but, but it's got this, like, I want to be here kind of feel to it, which is so nice. And then uh, here in Reno, if I ask people, why are you here in Reno? It always starts with a deep breath. <laughs> and then one of two stories unrolls. Uh, story number one is I moved here for a relationship that no longer exists and I just decided to stay. Or the other one is I moved here for a job that no longer exists and I decided to stay. And like that's the most common story. And so, uh, so there was somebody there who, who was standing while I was saying this, she was, she was standing there listening and she said, she said, Hmm, I've lived here all my life. And, and, uh, you know, I can't, I can't think of any time I've ever, you know, experienced somebody doing that. And I said, well, why are you in Reno? And she paused and she took a deep breath and we just all started laughing because she just did the thing. She just did the deep breath thing to explain why she's still in Reno. So every city has like a different vibe. Have you noticed that like Memphis versus Kansas City? Like, is there, is there a difference there or anything that stands out to you? Yeah, they're actually really comparable, I find, like, because they're both river towns. They're both, have, they have a lot of the same, like, cultural, the same cultural factors that shaped them, like, um, I mean, music and, and, like, even things like barbecue, like, they're both big barbecue towns and, and, like, music towns and river towns. And so they've kind of been shaped by a lot of the same forces, but I think, kind of from what I have experienced, Kansas City is like a decade ahead of Memphis in terms of like developing um, some of the really historic cool parts of town that have been vacant for for many years. Like there's a lot of oh. that sort of renaissance, cultural renaissance happening here in like the crossroads and West Bottoms and stuff. And, and a lot of the old warehouses and spaces that have just been unused for years are turning into like, you know, the West Bottoms are now this sort of mecca of antiques uh, antique stores and there's all these events, uh, music events and, and community events that are, so there's things like that starting to happen in Memphis, um, kind of along the riverfront and yeah, right, right. History basically. There does seem to be uh, a resurgence of, of, I guess, kind of the, the art district, you know? Um, so, so in Reno 20 years ago, it, if I remember actually this, this happened, I had a girlfriend cause I was going to college here. I had a girlfriend about 20 years ago in college. Um, she said she was going to go take a walk downtown by herself. And I was like, no effing way. You are not going downtown all by yourself today. If somebody said, yeah, I'm going to go downtown and hang out. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a, yeah. And, and we've got this whole kind of eclectic thing called Midtown that's like, it's a bunch of art, art district stuff and like residential lofts and, you know, just kind of cool. In Midtown, Kansas City, it's the same deal. It's like Westport, the old historic where the Santa Fe, California, Oregon Trail passed through and it's all the, now it's kind of like a bar entertainment district, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's what that's what I was getting to was the art district stuff means um, sort of more like local gig opportunities and stuff. Like there's yeah. there's little things going on all the time. Absolutely. Whereas, yeah. So so that's good. And like I was even in Vegas a couple of years ago, um, and my friends all wanted to kind of hang out on the the Vegas Strip, and I'm like, no, no, no. Let's let's go find let's go find the real Vegas. There's a Vegas. The, yeah. the, the people who live here must go somewhere to hang right. out and, you know, and, and like, let's go find that. I don't know what it is or where, where, what it's called or anything, but let's, let's just like do that. And so we, we did, we just started 
walking off the strip and started asking people like, you know, Hey, where's it going on here? Like, you know, low for locals. And we found this whole art district. Yeah. Like a whole bunch of handmade stuff. And there was like open mics and busking and these plays where you, you just paid a dollar to get in and see like a 15 minute play go, go on and, you know, like stuff like that. So, yeah. Cool. yeah so, so it, it, that's interesting. It's, it's coming back. And I, I just wonder, you know, I wonder if you can, like, if you wanted to tour around, could you, could you potentially tap into that in most cities? Like, I wonder if most cities have something like that. Yeah, I feel like to varying degrees, for sure. Like, even the small towns have their kind of, like, nucleus, you know, like, we just played right. a gig um, this past weekend in Tom <laughs> a little town, like, an hour outside Kansas City. And it's just an, a little bitty Midwestern town, you know, and there's not really a whole lot there, but there's like this new bar, Ryan's Public House, and it's like the hangout of the town, you know, yeah. and so that's just sort of the epicenter of all the activity. So it's really bustling because it's like the place you go to hear live music from, and they're drawn from Kansas City, they're drawn from, you know, but they're, but they're a little bit tucked away, so it's a nice little, like hour drive out there and then even in this tiny little town there's this really vibrant scene and that's like part of the live music scene there like i feel like there are places like that not every but not every town has it i don't think um, i wonder if it's becoming more important to people now you know just like mm -hmm. to have actual in-person connection and be able to go somewhere um because i i just i know there's there's a ton of stuff that that happens in reno and it wasn't that way 20 years ago that I can remember. Yeah. So I wonder, I wonder if, you know, it's sort of like a response to Facebook and social media and all that, and just kind of going and being human for a while somewhere. I don't know. You yeah. said, you said that Kansas city and Memphis were both river towns. And I feel like that meant something to you. Cause I don't really know what that means when you say, well. I mean, I know there's a river, but like, what is, yeah. what I impact mean, does that have? Speaking like, you know, like in Memphis, Mississippi River, here the Missouri River, like a lot of industry sprung up around the river and sort of the river town was the sort of like bustling center of industry. And, and it, it sort of is what put the city on the map, you know, it's like sort of the force that created the the city was its location on the river and there's this all the history you know and and sort of the map of the city is built around that um its significance in that way but there yeah there's also something like i don't know there's a kind of um quality and energy and just i don't know maybe I'd, maybe it's just nostalgic for me but something about like the river like that crosses so many borders and goes through so many states it's like it's a it's a way of getting somewhere like it i don't know there's a lot of significance tied up in the river it's it's got like, yeah just color in it and it's um it's also just like one of those sort of it's a part of the city's identity i guess um i kind of got that feeling i i went to new orleans a few years ago yeah. and i uh i wanted to again, get out of the touristy part and kind of go see what's going on. So I actually, I actually got a Katrina flood map and like it was a Google map overlay. And I thought, well, I want to go to like the deepest parts of the flood and see what those neighborhoods are like. And as far as I know, like they are still, you know, completely abandoned and there are just trees growing out of the houses. Like nature is consuming these really? areas and just like taking, yeah, yeah taking it back. But um, Lake Pontchartrain, okay, mm -hmm. there's that there's that big levee that goes all the way across. And what I didn't realize until I got there was that levee is scary because you can climb to see over it, you'd have to stand on the roof of a house and there are houses right behind the levee. So the levee is, you know, fully 10, 15 feet high. Right. When you go to the top of that levee and you stand there, you realize the, the lake level is actually above, you know, the street level on the other side. And that lake looks like an ocean. You can't see the end of it. So right. it, it's just, 
I, I, I'm standing there thinking, man, this this thin little I don't even know how it works, but this this thin little line separates you know chaos from order is what totally. it feels and, like. And and that that's like so much a part of its place in the community is that like I wrote a song about the um, uh, great flood, the Mississippi flood in 1927 that devastated so many states and it was really part of like the great migration north from the south because it just people had they had to go somewhere and there were their communities were just destroyed by this flood and the notion that like so that the city wouldn't be there without the river giving birth to the industry and sort of like shit giving birth to the city um yeah. and yet it also like can totally destroy what it created, like just like that, like, you know, in the crops and sort of like what makes the Delta so rich, is the river water, like makes that soil so rich. And like, yet it's also what obliterates the population and like totally, it's just, it gives and it takes. And it's just like a great creator and destructor. Like there's just a lot of significance and, and meaning tied up in that relationship between, you know, the river, t there's fear yeah. and there's attitude and it's so it's a very strange powerful dramatic kind of relationship that's really interesting um so i've never lived by any um like really like flood areas like that um even living on the ocean you know the, like okay tsunami you know yeah. once in your life but it, right. you know it's not you're not under constant threat of, I think this ocean is going to attack the city. You know, um, now, depending on where you live, you can get some nasty mudslides and things like that. But, but yeah, you know, I just, I, you're right. You, what you said, you know, it, it giveth and it taketh, right? Mm -hmm. I, I was down in um, Galveston and I was looking out at the Gulf of Mexico, which is like bath water, by the way. I don't know if you've ever been down there, but... Um, Kid, I, I did. Yeah, my dad's from Texas, so we took some trips down there. Yeah, and so I'm standing there, and I get this uneasy kind of feeling. I'm like, why do I feel so vulnerable right now? Mm -hmm. And then I figured it out because I started looking around, and I noticed that uh, any house that was nearby was on ten foot stilts. First of all, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm standing on the land, and I'm like, what do they know that I don't know? You know. <laughs> And, but then the other thing was, looking back from the shore, looking inland, I could see for, for miles. And, and, and I felt like even a six-inch rise in the water, a six-inch swell, would go in for miles. Like, there was just nothing to stop it. It's so flat. And um, living somewhere where you have that kind of tenuous relationship with nature. Yeah, there's a tension yeah yeah and and it's like it can be a friend or 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 not and and yeah when when the time comes uh it's going to wipe everything out and start over and, yeah, and there's so much like folk music from those you know that that centers around that around the river and um so many of the, yeah it's just a very right you know, it's at the heart of those communities yeah well that makes sense like exploring all these feelings we're talking about right yeah. now yeah, yeah I, I, I never really had the, uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're the first conversation I've ever had about this kind of, you know, um, relationship with nature type feeling. Um, so you, you said you wrote a song about that. Is it, is there like a clip on your website or anything? No, it's a song called Muddy Waters and it's just, yeah, I, I, I don't have it recorded anywhere yet. I will eventually. I uh, I don't know. It's just one of those ones I haven't done anything with yet. But how how many songs recorded or not? Like how many songs do you think you've you've written in your life? Like do you do you even try to like count it? I don't know how many. I mean, I've I've been writing for a while, and I I don't know. Probably like. I don't think of it in terms of numbers, I guess. I think of it more in, like, the music I've written that I know well enough to play. I could probably feel, like, three hours of just, you know, original music. But there, I have, then there's a lot of songs that I started and that are in varying degrees of completion, like... Yeah, probably, yeah. Probably over yeah. 100 
full and partial and like fragments. I don't know. That's that's about the same as me. Like I I feel like completed songs is probably somewhere in the eighties or nineties, and then I have some fragments of stuff and. Weirdly, lately, like the last couple of years, I have not felt like, um, well, I, I, I guess I should say that my, my creativity or the, st the, the stuff that I'm expressing is not coming out as music. It's coming out as writing and movement and, you know, just different stuff, not music. So I'm trying not to stress about it too much. Like, where did the music go? But, um, no, <laughs> interesting yeah that's a really interesting thing and kind of ties back to what you said earlier about how there's so many when you're a creative person you're generally creative in more than one way like it tends to come through in different ways different times and like you know there's so many mediums of creative expression and sometimes yeah. you're feeling it and sometimes you're you know you gravitate towards another and there's this whole sort of mysterious cycle to it that you just kind of have to go with the flow <laughs> yeah I, i've had to learn that over the years like you know there were times where i worried about like you know my stats right like how many songs am i doing or whatever um i i don't really stress about it anymore i i have i discovered that there was no use there was no utility in measuring things that way like mm -hmm. how long does it take me to write a song who cares just write a song and it's done when it's done is, is the real answer, you know? Yeah, it's done when it's ready. Be, it, these things unfold in their own time and you're just kind of there to capture it when it comes. Yeah, I am, I am the faithful servant. That's how I yeah. look at it. Um, unsigned is like this whole podcast. This is a, this is a hugely creative undertaking for me. Um, mm -hmm. Exploring a, a, like a completely different side where it's part performance but it's spoken word and yeah i listen to the episodes and i think maybe i can cut out a few ums and uhs maybe i can speak a little slower maybe i can let the silence just be there mm -hmm. so i think about all these things that i also would think about during performance so right now i think this is my creative outlet and it's so fun talking to all kinds of people let's Let's spin one of your songs, though. You sent me one through email. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to set it up, or do you want to just play it? Oh, just go on and play let's, it. Let's do it. I love that. <laughs> Is this you doing banjo? Mm -hmm. yeah? Okay. Sitting here waiting on a train with nothing, nothing on my mind. Don't know where I'm going, I got nowhere to be. Nobody's waiting on me. They try to tell you that's no way for man to be. And they say everybody needs somebody. But maybe that's all, maybe it's not. All I know is all I got. Fine. For a while he was mine, oh mine, 
everybody's gone now Now walk a lonesome mile There was a time I had a head full of dreams Had a heart that was bursting at the seams Now I got nothing And try to tell you it's no way for a gal to be They say everybody needs somebody I'd rest it here in the pouring rain Alone is waiting on the train Nothing on my mind Oh, I got nothing Nothing on my mind Hold on, Kelly. Okay, it's you, this is off your upcoming album, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so so like, is is everything in the can? Like, is that the final version, or is there any more, or what? Uh, no, it's 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 done. It's pre it's you know printed, and I have hard copies, and it's coming down the line to be released digitally. But yeah, it's finished. Okay, I am completely blown away by what I just heard, and I'll tell you why. Um, well, first of all, amazing voice. I, and, and, and it's, you're not afraid to share it. It's, it's right out in front in the mix, you know? Mm -hmm. And I can hear everything. I can hear everything in your voice, all the expressiveness. I have a personal love for music like that, where, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's like that vocal is, is really out front. Um, the other thing is I love music that is okay with, with letting things breathe. I, I think there's a, there's like a quote, it's B.B. King or somebody like that. Music is between the notes. Have you ever heard that quote? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that. Right? Yeah. It, I mean, it makes so much sense. Like as soon as I heard it, I thought, yeah, what? Right, exactly. Yeah, why am I thinking about that? It's it's all it's everything that happens between the notes that really, really makes it um, something. And you just have an intuition about about making use of that. Let, let me come at it from a different angle. When I play a gig, I, I I just do guitar vocal, just like just like what we heard there. Okay, and one of the things. I feel limited by is I'm not a great guitar player. I wouldn't even really call myself a guitar player. I'd call myself a singer who plays some guitar, you know, mm -hmm. to back myself up, but it's not my instrument. You know, I don't really know it that well. Um, I pretty much hang out in first position, I'll capo up or down, but I'm still doing the same thing. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm not all over the fingerboard or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And one of my, fears nobody's ever said this to me but i've said it to myself over and over again is that my guitar playing is boring that it that, that it makes it makes the performance boring and that i play the same pattern too often in too many different songs it's the same thing and even in the in one song i you know um i don't change it up enough and it's just you know like i just i get all up in my head about that kind of stuff mm -hmm. you used the same arpeggiation the whole way through this song on your banjo and I loved it I, mm -hmm. and especially with your voice because it gave me room to to pay attention to other stuff I didn't I didn't have to um, worry about like oh it, you know is something gonna sneak up on me with that banjo like how much do I need to how much do I need to devote to that right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and and there's there's no there's no slight in this at all it's it, like i 
I think those things about myself. But when I hear somebody else doing it, like you, just guitar, vocal, banjo, vocal, I'm not bothered by it at all. So like, why do I, why do I hold myself differently when it sounds so great coming from like I, nothing's missing? You don't need to add a thing. You don't need to take away with it. Like it, that is perfection. What I just heard, mm-hmm. and um, and it can be that simple. You know, right. so it, it, yeah. it, well, and, and, and saying it's simple is even an understatement because there's so much nuance. There's like, like I can go so deep into listening to your vocals or, or actually I found myself even listening to, um, what you were doing on the banjo too. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is simplicity isn't necessarily boring. Yeah, no, it's an important distinction. And, and, you know, that's so much of like folk music and old time music. It's simple formulaically like you know it's it's the and it, and that's part of its comfort and part of its charm is that you know so many of those songs if you know G C and D you can play like such a vast majority of the canon of, of folk songs like you know it's it's they're simple three chord songs they're meant to be simple they're meant to be something anybody you know could sing and join in and, and that there was this sort of community built around that accessibility of form like there's something beautiful about that but then yeah there's all these shades of like meaning and and the nuance like you said that are you know in the words in the in the dynamics in the you know there's so many sort of layers that but it still reads as something very palatable you can just digest it you know yeah, yeah, it's accessible, it's vulnerable. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to remember this experience and hopefully not worry about it when the next time I'm out playing. Because, uh, yeah. like, I got to tell you, I think that that is part of the reason that's kept me home and not doing music for a while. I told, I told you, was that during the sound check or was that part of it? I can't remember, but... I was telling you that I hadn't been writing too many songs in the last couple of years. And yeah. that goes for performing too. And, and part of the reason is I, I just, I feel so um, um, fraudulent, I guess. Like going out and just playing my, playing my, you know, I have like five moves on the guitar. <laughs> and, well, you know. Thought. I mean, it's something I definitely... I mean, I, I'm, I'm self-taught, like, on banjo and, and what I play of guitar and stuff. I've just sort of, you know, I, I think of myself as a writer, first and foremost. My voice is the instrument that I'm, I've am you know, i been singing my whole life. I'm most comfortable with that. Same, yeah. So, you know, those are my, that's my, those are my priorities and my focus and what's most natural to me. But then, you know, like, with banjo and guitar, I was always, like, I was writing songs and then I'd figure out what I needed to do on banjo or guitar to serve the song. And sometimes it was something I didn't know how to do. Some, sometimes I was hearing something in my head that I was just like, I don't know how to do what I'm hearing that this song needs. And that's where the growth and the innovation and all that was came from that need to like find the right thing that was in service of the song. And so that is, I feel like what motivates growth, like on any instrument. And for me, it comes from the songwriting that this is, you know, whatever tricks I have in my bag are not right for this song. So I've got to figure something else out, you know, and, and that yeah. is, that's an important thing. But then also sometimes like, yeah, sometimes you do just need to keep it simple. And it's so easy to overthink or overcomplicate things, especially in a particular headspace as an, as a writer, like you can get into that zone where you're just like so hypercritical of everything you do that you don't even want to put out anything new because you can't get past like the second guessing and the doubting yourself. And then when you show it to one person who you trust and they're like, this is great. And you're like, really? Because I've been like battling over this thinking it was just kind of trash. And so, yeah, there's this whole mystery of your own, like the artist's own mind. You're your own worst critic in a lot of ways. And sometimes things never get past the drawing board just because you can't like let go of them. But that's a shame. (laughs) Yeah. Gosh, I love just listening to you talk because you're, you, you have such a great way of, of like concisely phrasing these ideas that I grapple with. 
like you said, you've learned enough guitar to serve the song. That's exactly how I think of it. And, and, and that's what I think of uh, my guitar skills is anytime somebody asks, and I've, I've even had people say, wow, great guitar playing, man. And I go, no, not really. I just, you know, I, I'm just, I barely know enough to support the song. And that's where it, it's, it stops. I, I don't sit around and practice riffs like some people do or any of that. You know, I'm not, I'm not a guitarist. I'm a, I'm a songwriter. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I love that. And there was, there was something else, uh, Oh, just about you know how critical we can be of, of our of our own music mm-hmm. I've had the experience more than once where I've been reluctant to play a song that I wrote because I thought this song is just too it's too personal it's too it's nobody else is going to be able to relate to this because it's just too much of my own whatever uh, and you know uh let's see like 10 years ago i i went through uh, a divorce and i had this song that was kind of about that not directly but um well i guess it was i guess it was directly about it but anyway it was just kind of you know i was i was stepping through my feelings of of that you know some, something about uh i had a lot of um a lot of boxes sitting around, you know, after I moved out, I had all these boxes uh, full of stuff, but I didn't even want to open them up because I knew whatever was in there was, was, you know, just uh, kind of an old memory waiting to haunt me kind of thing. Right. So I wrote a, I wrote a song about this and I remember I was out, I was out playing and I, I, <laughs> so I, I did the thing that I tell people never to do. Um, I sort of apologized for it before I played it, you know, like, I like it when people just play the song, just play the song, you know, don't, don't set it up, nothing, just, just play it and let it be what it is. But this one, I was like, well, yeah, you know, I wrote it and it's probably not anything to any of you, but I'm going to play it and I'll see if I can get through it and blah, 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 you know, all of that. And afterwards, somebody came up and you know what? She was in the middle of a divorce and she heard this and was just like, that's it right there. That's, that's it. Yeah. You know, like I want a copy of that song. That's what she said. And then just the other night I was at a songwriter, um, songwriter round. Do you guys do those out there? Oh, I love, I love, that's probably my favorite format, honestly. Yeah. It's a great place to try out the new stuff. And like, because you feel like you're so insulated by all these other people who go through the exact same thing you do. Like it's easier to struggle in front of people who, you know, understand <laughs> I like it for that reason, and I also like it because I don't have to carry the whole night myself, you know? Yeah, and if you keep engaged. It keeps everything so fresh. I, I love them because I have, like, um, like, 15 minutes between songs, you know? Uh, by the time it gets back around to me, you know, it's been 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I can try to remember the lyrics. Like, like it takes no preparation, basically. You can just show up and... Yeah. And you don't need a set list because, like, someone inevitably says something or plays something where you're like, oh, my gosh, I have a song that, like, fits that theme perfectly or that makes me think of this. And so I never end up playing what I plan to play anyway. It's just, like, this evolution that's really cool and natural and fun. Yeah, that's that's interesting, too. Well, in, in songwriter rounds, I never play with a set list, but I stopped playing with a set, set list altogether because mm-hmm. I would sit at home, I'd make my set list, I'd be like, this is what I'm going to do. And then I would get there and the situation would be real, you know, and it was like real people. And I just realized like, man, this, this, this static set list that I made up is completely out of context here. Like I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to make up a set. I'm going to read the crowd and I'm going to make up whatever, you know, just like whatever comes to me. Um, and yeah, I, can't- I can do that now too, except I always have to have like something like these are songs I can choose from because that's another phenomenon for me is I'll get up on stage and a lot of times I'll just be like, I've written songs. Like what songs do I know? What? Mm-hmm. Like so many, <laughs> And you think of how much stuff we've written and it's like, it just evaporates when you're in front of people sometimes. And so, but I, I never stick to a set list, but it's like, I'd like to have options and then I feel it out and there's an ebb and flow to the crowd that you kind of try to match. And yeah. 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 That's the thing is, is matching the ebb and flow. I, I found that 
I was stressing myself out trying to adhere to the set list because I didn't feel like it fit the moment, you know? Right. So I stopped doing that. But anyway, the other night, songwriter round, there were four of us up there. Um, I did that thing again where I said, you know, I've, I, I wrote this song and, and it's just for me, but I'm going to play it anyway because why not? I'm at a songwriter round. Where, where better Right. To play an obscure song than here. So um, so I played this, and, and it, it, it was a song that was basically a, a, like a letter to my younger self. So mm -hmm. it just felt really personal and like weird to sing. I don't know. I, I like There's certain subjects that I feel are um, make me sound crazy, so I don't play them out a lot, but, um, and that would be one of them like talking to my inner child, you know? So, but anyway, <laughs> I played this song and of course, of course it was like people's favorite song, you know? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, of all the songs you played, like, yeah, I like that one the best. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, yeah. uh, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to be that vulnerable, but when we can be, I have found it's almost always rewarded actually. Yeah. And I think, I think one of our, at least one of my, it might be part of the artistic personality, I don't know, but I think we tend to think we're like special or something and that we experience the world differently from from, from people. And in some ways, I guess we do, but really at the end of the day, like we're just human beings and human beings share the same emotions and ex so many of the same experiences. And it's like, we expect that things are not going to translate or that we just are weird and different. And it's actually like, no, you're just a human being and people get people. It's, there's a shared experience of being human that resonates with everybody. And that's sometimes a surprise. I mean, it is to me like that certain things of mine that feel so personal or that feel so specific are actually like universally true. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. There was, there's a song I wrote where I'm the bad guy in the song you know i'm the one doing the leaving and it's obviously the wrong move but i'm doing it anyway and i'm just i'm the asshole okay and i didn't play that song out for the longest time because i thought well people are gonna, this is going to make people really upset i don't know i'm not gonna play this song but yeah i started playing it and people were like wow that song they they could relate to one side or the other, right? Right. <laughs> and yeah. so it's just it, yeah, it's 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 interesting what we tell ourselves <laughs> to prevent to avoid sharing, <laughs> to avoid vulnerability. We make up a lot of stories. But I don't get the sense that you do. I do. I can say that. No, so I mean and sometimes like you get sick of your own self and your own stories or you run out, you know, you're in a part of your life where there's just not a whole lot happening and you don't, but then I remember like there are so many stories out there and there are people who can't really tell their own stories. And that's what we're here for too, is like to tell those stories. And, and like, I love writing about historical things like events and, and stories that are out there that we've forgotten about, you know, that are important and that just cause they happened a hundred years ago or, you know, a thousand years ago doesn't make them irrelevant like human beings were as much human beings back then as we are now and there's this sort of like continuum of storytelling that we can constantly go back and tap into and make relevant to today's world and so when I run out of my own stories to tell it's like don't despair there are so many stories like right for the taking that yeah. is isn't isn't that so true and, and strange to think about like like I just got done reading the Bhagavad Gita which is kind of the roots of, say, like Hinduism, I guess. Uh -huh. um, well over 5,000 years old, one, like one of the oldest texts that we can find anywhere. Mm -hmm. And in that text is the expression of every emotion we feel today with the same fidelity, the same... Uh, realness i guess yeah the, the the same profundity you know yeah, why is it so surprising to us but it is 
Yeah, like ah, uh, they 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 weren't they weren't really feeling stuff back then. Well, no, I actually remember as a child, like you know, when you'd watch movies in black and white, or even when you watch movies like that from the seventies. There's that super saturated like color palette. Like in my child's mind, I. I truly thought the world looked different. Like I thought there was a time when the world was black and white. Like when that's just how human beings experience of their environment, everything was black and white. And I remember that revelation of like, Oh my gosh, the, the colors and the way that like the world around me looks is exactly how it looked like to them, which was just right. a profound revelation to me. But it's like, yeah, it's been this way for, it's been this way since, the birth of humanity. <laughs> of right, ways. right. And and just the, the same spectrum of, of emotions, too. Yeah. And the same wonder of what is this? Where am I? What is my purpose here? Where does it begin? Where does it end? All, all yeah. these questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we still ask them. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, it, it, we've... It's yeah, so so it's amazing how much what we think of as ancient wisdom still applies, and, and um, I don't know how you would feel about this guy Jordan Peterson, but he's he's all over the place right now. Um, he I don't know. okay, he's well, he he's he's all mixed up with like you know extreme left wing political battles and conservative stuff and just all he's he's all mixed up in that right now but um but his his primary focus over the last 30 years has been studying mythology and figuring out how people derive meaning and purpose and like what is goodness and and what's good and what's bad and why and uh one one observation he had was you know these stories have survived so long because they have enduring wisdom right yeah. so it, it, and 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 all the all the non-essential pieces have been removed so you know you could make an argument for example that every word of the bible matters because it's still around so many thousands of years later mm-hmm. if it if it if it didn't have some, if it didn't serve something, it it would have been you know dropped or lost over the years or whatever. But yeah, so we, transcendent about these things that they that we still they still mean so much to us and are still yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. So so I I so therefore I think there is such a thing as truth and. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and that that's a big statement for some people, but but yeah, I think there is such a thing as truth, uh, and I and I think it's reflected in in all of these um, you know very ancient writings who, who that have survived for so long. I think there's a reason they did. So right, as artists, like, I mean, to your point, we we can draw from all of that, and I I think at least the way I experience songwriting is yeah I'm, I'm trying to get at the truth i'm trying to i'm trying to cut a certain angle that that shows a, a certain truth right i'm trying to tell the truth and yeah and sometimes you catch yourself not doing that when you're writing like there are songs i you know have held on to for years because i'm just not sure if they're good in that way like i'm not sure if i really mean them you know? like if you believe them yeah, like, or if, if they're, like, if they're genuine, if they're, if they're really truth-seeking, like, songs, like, or if they're just sort of, like, you know, fabricated out of something else that's just, yeah, that's, and that's why I hold on to them, because I want to figure it out before I put it out there. Like, that's, there's a sort of, like, response, social responsibility to being an artist that, you know, you're, we shape culture, we shape, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a great, what we do has an impact. And so there's a responsibility that comes with that, that you don't just want to put trash out there. It's like you want to put something out there that means something and that you can stand behind and be like, I wrote this and I mean it. And I think it's true. Yeah, that is so important. And, and that's, that's where I've kind of been stuck on songwriting the last few years is I've sort of run out of words. Like, I, I think <laughs> this is going to sound maybe kind of weird, but... I think that there is as much truth in a single beautiful note 
as there is in a whole song about something. And so since I've been feeling that way, I sit down to write about something and I think like, well, what can I write about? I mean, it's, 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 all, it's all been talked about. I, I don't have anything to add to the conversation right now, not lyrically anyway. So I'm digging into uh, soundscapes and, and, you know, stuff like that, like non, non-lyrical, I guess, instrumental uh, th- things, ideas that can't be expressed through words as easily as through just music. Uh, so uh, anyway, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in the throes of that right now and something about this conversation inspired me to think about that. Um, so where, uh, where are you going from, from here? You're releasing an album. It's almost done. You said that you're just waiting on some stuff to come back, right? Artwork or whatever. Um, we're just actually, I'm just kind of in the pre-sale phase, so it's scheduled to be released um, in November, and I'm just kind of doing doing hard copy sales until then, and um, just been you know busy getting tour stuff together, and and um, yeah, the album is is technically done. It's just kind of waiting the wings to be released onto the global stage, but <laughs> yeah, it's ready. Are you uh, are you going digital with all that? Are you going to be out there? Spotify, iTunes, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, all those platforms in, in just a couple months, and um, hoping I'm, I'm, I would like to put out vinyl um, of it as well as kind of small batch vinyl in the next. You know, I wanted to get it out every other way first, but um, that is something people want. I've found um, in this genre, Americana folk kind of roots music. It just suits that. Um, tangible sort of timeless just there's a quality to that that really um resonates with the genre of music and i can hear the album like i can hear it on vinyl like it just i feel like it belongs there so eventually yeah yeah so what's up with all the vinyl lately what do you what do you think's going on because i mean i'm always in my car listening to stuff like it's very rare that i just sit down i mean even when i'm watching netflix or something i'm not i remember growing up like we'd all sit down and we'd watch tv or whatever right uh, that like doesn't happen anymore to me um i don't even have a tv I don't yeah know. no i mean i mean culturally things have shifted towards sort of i mean this is a really interesting conversation i was having with a musician friend the other day just about like how we process music now in the, how the industry is going, moving towards digital, you know, and moving even less towards albums, moving towards singles, moving towards like instant gratification kind of stuff, like a lot of quick release stuff strung out throughout the year rather than like, here's an album. And then two years later, here's an album. Like, right, like a body of work. Right. Like we want sort of like a steady diet from an artist, which is a new kind of idea and in a lot of ways I think it's really messed up but in a lot of ways too it's like you have to you have to know how to fit into the way things are evolving if you want it to be a sustainable thing but then you also have to remember you know what are the things that are going to outlast everything and I actually I think I actually have this I did this um this is a timely conversation because I just actually have my first thing on vinyl there's this guy Ted um he does this Never Records project. It came to Kansas City. It's here right now. And you basically go in. This is my record. Um, it's one song on here. But he, he does this project. He's done it in London and Ireland and um, New Orleans and Jordan. I mean, he's, like, been around the world with this thing. And he sets up shop. And then you go in and he, like, records a song and then he right there in front of you it's like a three-hour session you record a song he does a quick mix in pro tools and then he puts it on vinyl right in front of you and he walks you through the process and and it's free and it's an amazing thing and it's this sort of like art installation that he travels around the world and then he keeps a copy you get to take a copy and then he has this archive of songs from around the world and he was explaining you know sort of talking about vinyl and how like the CD is becoming obsolete. Like they're not making cars and computers and all that with a CD drive anymore. Like there are people who, you know, 
I just have the hard copies of my album and people don't want to buy a CD because they don't have a way to play it. Like we're already there in a lot of ways. And yeah. MP3 itself is like, how long are we going to be able to play MP3s? And, and, and how, and the fact that an MP3 is so compressed that you're losing some of the nuance, you're losing some of the sonic nuance just by the mere compression of that file into an MP3. We're listening to things at a lower quality and vinyl, like I think part of the reason why it's still around and why there's this regeneration of interest in it is because it's never changed. Like it has this wonderful, beautiful quality and a record player is always going to play records. And there's this sort of like just soul and tangibility and like there's a relationship with that record. And there's something about like putting a record on the turntable and putting the needle down, like the crackle. It's, it's a sensory sort of like sensory experience that you just don't get from, you know, you know what, you know what else there is. I, I just realized this as you were talking about it. Uh, when you play a vinyl record, it's never the same twice. You're wearing it out as you play it. That, that totally. kind of makes every spin special because Absolutely. it's yeah. finite, you know, almost kind of like gains more character with age i mean i think about it like reading a book like when you read a hard copy of a book like i'll never be a kindle person and it, it's so efficient and it makes so much sense and it's so like practical but i want to hold a book i want to take a book with me everywhere i go i want to make my mark on it and then i want to give it to somebody you know like yeah. there's something about this tangibility and i think like you said earlier in this conversation about do you think we're reacting to like the sort of digital age of facebook and like this distance between you and the world like everything sort of these interactions that happen on a like even what we're doing now like we're having a conversation but we're not in the same room and like there's this distance in this digital age and like is there i think it's kind of creating a hunger for live performance to like have a real connection with someone in person like to have that human connection and i think it's the same thing in 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 the return to vinyl, like we crave sort of the physical, that's just going to always be a part of the human experience. Yeah. We're physical beings. We want to be able to touch and feel and see and interact with our environment, like in a, in a concrete, like kinesthetic way. And I don't think that's as long as human beings are around, that's always going to be the truth of our essence. We're always going to be physical. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I wonder, I wonder, this is so fascinating. I wonder it seems to me that impermanence plays a, a, a big role in what we pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So I was having this con conversation with, uh, there were, let's see, it was, it was a couple, couple episodes ago. Um, all these guys, young lady was, was their name. Uh, and we were, we were talking about what would it work? to put a song out and say, I'm only going to keep this song up until it has a thousand plays and then it's over. Or like look at Instagram stories and Facebook stories. The, the, the whole point of it is that it's only around for 24 hours and then it's gone. So there's something that we respond to about impermanence. There's something about impermanence that helps us prioritize the world, right? And vinyl is a great example, uh, even better than tape and, and CD. CDs are hardly impermanent. Um, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but now streaming. So, so I think it's good. Like the information age is good for things that you want to stay around forever, you know, for archival purposes. But, but that human experience, I think, involves impermanence. We have to think about this more. I, I, I feel like there's something there. But there's a place for it all. Like, I mean, I think of how much I drive and like to drive. And like, I, I'm a big Spotify listener, you know, mm -hmm. like as much as, you know, the, from a songwriter's perspective, you know, it's not, it's not going to make you money, like selling a hard copy of something like, you know, but there's this accessibility. You can experience something you wouldn't otherwise have access to because I'm not going to buy you know, a million albums, but there's a million albums on Spotify that I can like listen through and then connect with and sort of like sift through. Like there's mm -hmm. a place for that. And when I'm in my car driving, like 
I can be listening to music that way in a way that I wouldn't be able to, you know, vinyl isn't an option. But then there's a place for the vinyl where you're sitting down and you're actually like listening. Like, like it's a, it's a conscious and sort of, it's a different kind of attention and there's a place for both. And I think the digital stuff's really important and I value it in that it, it makes so much more that I wouldn't otherwise have access to accessible to me, you know? Right, like I, right. The world is just right there, and I can just experience music from all around the world that I would never cross paths with in my natural, like, day-to-day -day life, but I have this sort of, like, window into the world that's beautiful and wonderful, and I'm glad we have that. And I feel like we could keep talking for hours about all this kind of stuff. I, I love thinking about this kind of stuff and just, just wondering. But, yeah, that's really cool that, that you're um, – you're so you're, you're doing vinyl and digital uh you know streaming whatever whatever wherever it can go and i i, I have noticed the same thing that you talked about which is uh, in fact we were just talking about this on a previous episode i think it was i think it was the gibbonses the the, the episode right before this where we were talking about when i go out to see a local show or something they have cds for sale and I don't buy the CD. Well, I do buy the CDs, but I buy the CD knowing I'm never going to play the CD. You know? Right, but you don't want people to buy something they're not going to use. Like, I want them to have the medium they're going to want to listen. Yeah, yeah. And so I've switched over to just buying T-shirts instead because at least I'll wear yeah. those. Right. But it, it, it's, it's, it is strange. I, like, I didn't think about it, but I don't think my car has a CD player. My laptop definitely doesn't. Like, I, don't think, I don't think I have a way to play a CD if I wanted to. And yeah. so it's it's funny because people are like, oh, yeah, give me, have a listen to my CD. And I'm saying, how? Uh, and, and yeah, loading MP3s onto the phone, nobody wants to do that anymore. Like if you were to try to yeah. s sell a zip file of MP3s, it's like that's, like you said, who, who knows how long that's even going to still be possible. Mm -hmm. So it seems that the extremes are streaming and vinyl. And so you might be onto something by – by tackling both of those extremes and then selling t-shirts to the middle ground. Yeah. Well, and there's some music you don't, you know, there's some types of music that just don't belong on vinyl. Like you wouldn't buy, there's, there seems to be a certain kind of music that suits that medium and then other ones, not so much. Like that's another thing too. Like you gotta, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. There's an amazing amount of fidelity on vinyl though. Uh, so mm -hmm. I went into this high-end audio store. They had like hundred thousand dollars speakers in there, like insane. I don't even know how you could spend a hundred thousand dollars on speakers, but they knew. And it was these big towers that had you know different sized speakers going all the way down to you know woofers and subwoofers and little tweeters all the way at the top of it. It it, it somehow split things into, you know, like 10 channels of, of uh, different, you know, frequency ranges that these speakers were covering. And the chair was placed exactly, you know, in the middle a certain distance from each speaker. And he put on like an old Beatles album from the 60s. I heard stuff I have never heard in that album. And it's, it's in there. It's in the vinyl. Yeah, you do. It's it's so high. You get you get all the nuances. You get all the character. You get all the little. And and really, I mean, actually, I do think every. I take back what I said. I think every kind of music, kind of, it's maybe something I thought before I went into the studio and heard like punk rock bands that he had recorded on vinyl and like spoken word and and folk and like orchestral stuff, and it all sounded better on vinyl. I mean, there's just something like. I don't know, there's something to it that I, I'm kind of new to the idea, really. Um, I didn't grow up listening to stuff on vinyl. I didn't, you know, the, in other words, I'm kind of getting converted to it because it makes a lot of sense. You know what so else I like about vinyl? The big pictures on the album covers. Love it's that. It's satisfying, isn't it? It's yeah. satisfying. I don't know even why. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can pull out one, and I mean, it's as big as your face, so if somebody's face is on there, it's like, you're looking at the person, like, real no, size. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. 
And I mean, now it's down to like a little thumbnail on the phone. And you're like, what's going on in that thumbnail? So you're zooming in on everything all the time. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's that's cool. So, where do you see this going for you? Um, well, actually, maybe we should save that question because that's one of the lightning round questions: is what, what do you see happening in the next year? Um, but so, like, sort of just near term, like, what's your plan? You got the album coming. Are you going to start playing around town, or what are you doing with it? Uh, well, we've kind of been. I mean, this is a unique experience in that it's like taken. It's my first album. It, it took me, you know, the past two and a half years basically to make. I, I moved here three years ago, and I hadn't digged or anything. You know, music was something I loved, but it wasn't professional aspiration really. And the in the and the city brought that out of me. Brought that, you know, kind of woke me up to that. And um, so I had a lot to learn. I, I, you know, spent two and a half years basically like just learning how to be in the studio. I had learning how to learning what a good mix sounds like like we i co-produced the album with um my my good friend stosh who plays a bunch of different instruments on the album and is going to be going on tour with me kind of as a duo act um but yeah so i i kind of you know spent a long time just learning how to make an album and um so we played, you know, and over those two and a half years, we played, you know, all around town and really kind of um, immersed ourselves in the music scene here and in outlying areas. But we hadn't, we have not toured beyond sort of the greater Kansas City area. So uh, we actually leave Saturday and that'll be our first uh, run of, of tours or going back towards my, my home land, um, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, um, kind of Kentucky and Illinois and back around. So that's a new experience. And that's really now that we have hard copies of the album in hand and merch and all that, we can kind of start treating it like a business in a different way. Whereas before, you know, all you have is this live performance and I couldn't really justify like going on a tour and not having anything to leave with people, you know, yeah. show or something like you kind of got to have something that you can, that people can remember you by. <laughs> so that's really, uh, there's a lot changing right now in my own life. Like just looking at being on the road most of the year and, um, working the album and just, you know, giving it the, the, the cream of my energy, which I've never, you know, I've had a full-time job and all that before now. So this is the first chance I've had to really kind of give it, give it at my everything. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about, uh, day gigs and stuff like that um did i hear you just say you currently don't have a full-time job like you're trying to go after this right yeah so i mean okay. i have um i yeah that's sort of the transition i'm in is um it's like a chicken or egg sort of thing it's hard getting started because when yeah. you're nobody and nobody knows you you know it's hard to afford to put yourself out there and do it full time. But unless you kind of like can build up the momentum, then you never seem to get anywhere. So it's, it's, a um, there's kind of a faith aspect to it of just, you know, you, you set yourself up, you prepare, you get sort of the, the cornerstone in place and then you adapt, but you do it with urgency. And like, I have, you know, thankfully my job here, um, which I've been waiting tables, you know, they, are going to let me pick up shifts, you know, when I'm in town, if I need to, like, I'm not scheduled, I'm not obligated, but if I'm around and I, and I have time and I want to do that, um, that's an option, but I'm really trying to just go, you know, at it full force and just kind of see what's possible and, and how far a lot of it's just research and development. You, you kind of learn how far outside of, you know, a place you can tour for it to be worthwhile and not, um, overextend yourself to the point where it, you're, you know, putting more into it than you can get out of it. Like it's a, it's a learning process. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I've kind of done that with unsigned too. Uh, what I mean is I learn whatever I learn from this episode is going to go into the next episode. Right. And yeah. the goal is to just keep doing another episode, do another one, do another one, do another one until someday, I, I think what'll happen is, is someday we'll, we'll hit a tipping point of some kind. And we were talking a little during the sound check about like, what might that tipping point be? 
I mean, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to keep doing these episodes, keep showing up, and I, I, I think, I believe, I guess, that someday the purpose of Unsigned and the vibe and what it's all about is, is, is going to click with people in some kind of important way and then it's going to be like, oh, now I get it. Now I understand, like, here's where Unsigned fits in my brain, and then it'll be something. Whereas right now, we're, we're building up the audience, and um, mm. that's kind of a, it's, it's a slow process, turning that wheel, you know? So I, I get what you're saying, and, and, and not, losing, not losing faith while that process is happening yeah. is really really yeah it's 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 hard because we all want the outcome right we want the like hey come on like let's yeah. let's let's get let's get it going and uh um <laughs> there's this i don't know if this is the best guy for life advice or not but matthew mcconaughey has a little motivational video out there about you know the difference Happiness is outcome based. Joy is moment based. So you can have joy in what you're doing in the moment, um, whereas chasing happiness is a bad idea because as soon as you, even if you achieve whatever you set out to do, now you're back to being unhappy again because it's always about like getting that outcome, getting that outcome. So mm -hmm. for me, that's important to remember, like to just have fun in these interviews and experience the joy of this and not not really care about like how it's how it how how the value of it is measured so mm -hmm. that's what what you said makes me think of all that stuff and that's what you're out there doing right now you're you're trying to put it all together for yourself this is your, your first album you've you've worked a while on it and um now it's time to go out and and see what happens and and just kind of yeah. be of service to the music Mm -hmm. So, well, let's start bringing this in for a landing. Um, I have a lightning round of questions that I always ask everybody. Are you ready for the lightning round? Hit me. <laughs> okay. Before I jump into the lightning round, have we talked about everything you wanted to talk about? Do you have any other announcements, Something, anything like that? I don't think so. Okay. Cool. We we covered it, and there's so much more we could cover, but yeah. um, I gotta I gotta shut it down here eventually. So okay, so so here's the lightning round. First question of the lightning round: Name three people. Call out three people who you would like to invite to be interviewed on Unsigned. Okay, um, I'm gonna call out the Match Sellers. They're a um, Kansas City bluegrass duo, folk duo that I love. Um, I want to call out Terry Quinn. She's another Kansas City banjo player, singer, songwriter. And um, Dylan Moses, uh, or Dylan McGonigal, he um, is a, a young folk writer here in Kansas City um, as well. So those are the three I think would be really, really good for this. Three okay, of so the people I know. So same, ag same again? Okay, um, Match Sellers. Um, Terry Quinn and Dylan McGonigal. The three of you have been called out to come get interviewed on Unsigned. So we'll get with you on that. I, uh, after the interview, I want to make sure I have links to everybody um, yeah. because I'm not sure if the links are the same as the ones you put in originally. Oh um, <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> That's okay. I just want to. I want to make sure so that, so that when uh, when Anthony goes and posts stuff, because we do show notes and everything with links and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, lightning round question number two. This is this is the dream interview. Okay. This is the person who, if they came on unsigned, it would just absolutely blow your mind. And if we can get this person to come on unsigned, I want to get you back to co-host the episode. So who is that dream call out my dream call out would be at this moment um mandolin orange do you know them mandolin orange yeah they're so they're so good and they're so 
I don't know. I feel like there's all their stuff really resonates with me, and I feel like they're, you know, they've been an important part of my development as a musician and a singer songwriter and sort of in the scene. So yeah, Mandolin Orange. They're main. They're a duo, but they but they tour the band sometimes, and they're kind of like, yeah, just a really great folk Americana. Yeah, yeah I got them. I got them right here. I'm uh, I'm opening up. Spotify right now. Oh, Spotify's gonna make me log in. Hold on here. Maybe I can just do it this way. I will search for Mandolin Orange on Spotify. Um, okay, found it, and let's just let's just hear a little little smattering. Okay, here's Wildfire. This has eighteen million eighteen million streams, so it should be pretty promising. good production for sure brave men fall with the battle cry tears fill the eyes of their loved ones and their brothers gone so it went for Joe Safe, but a country unborn is free and it spread like wildfire. Wildfire. From the ashes grew sweet liberty, like the seeds of the pines when the forest burns, they open up and grow. Burn again. And it should have been different. It could have been easy, but too much money rolled in to ever enslave. Cry for war, spread like wildfire. Nice sound. We'll just we'll cut it off there and get them in to uh, to to get a full interview. So uh, so okay, yeah. So we got we got them. Mandolin Orange. You've been called out for a dream interview, co-hosted, co-hosted. It's not just going to be me hosting the thing. Kelly Hunt is going to be hosting it with me. That would be dreamy. We would we would love to do that. Okay. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's one of the lightning round questions. Next lightning round question. This is a new one I've been thinking about. What do you think people misunderstand about you? Oh, hmm, that's a that that is a hard question. I don't know. I think. Um, I think the people who know my music really well and who like have who I've become close with because they come out to my shows and I have like a relationship with them. It's different, but um, in general, this was one of my big struggles with uh, starting to play my music and like being on stage and stuff. Is you don't know how you come across to people. Like there's kind of there has to be a difference between are in the real world and like how you are on stage like even if it's subtle like there has to be a distinction and there there is you feel it and it's not that you're being inauthentic or whatever but um I don't know I guess I have a a persona or a personality on stage that maybe I seem um I don't know maybe more uh assertive or or like social or extroverted than I am like I'm actually incredibly introverted and I spend most of my time alone and like I love that and it's really hard for me to be social um one-on-one I'm great like I love one-on-one conversation like that's my jam but 
I hate crowds. I hate being like in noisy places. I don't really do well in like social environments. So I think people think that I'm a lot more outgoing and kind of um, like vibrant than I really am. <laughs> I'm actually just like to go to bed really early and read books and drink tea and like embroider. <laughs> I'm just a little old lady. <laughs> but people have a different conception of you when you're like, you know, up on stage or whatever, doing your thing. They think you're fearless and that you're just like, you know, they see you in a certain light that's really very shallow light. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh eight thirty, nine o'clock rolls around and like I'm ready to I'm ready to call it. You know, I'm Crawl in bed with a book and just like read till I fall asleep at eight thirty. Yeah, that's that's about right. Um, yeah. I mean, man, that song right around the other night it went till like nine, and I was yawning. <laughs> I was yawning up on stage, and I'm, I lean I lean back, and I'm like, how many more do we got? How many yeah. more? We got our work here, right? <laughs> yeah. No. I always try to play the early slot. <laughs> Okay, uh, so Unsigned has a Spotify playlist where we we feature our our guest artists, and when you have a credit now, you when your album comes out, just tell me, uh, pick one of your songs, and we'll put it on the playlist. Okay. Okay. Final lightning round question. This is for all of the aspiring artists out there. Okay. Okay. If you woke up tomorrow. And you know what you know, but you don't know anybody, and they don't know you. You haven't recorded anything. Like, none of that's happened. You, you still have your songs. You have your talent, your skills. But you're kind of just sitting on the couch. Not much is going on. Put together a little plan of action. What would you do to, um, if you had to begin from there, what would you do? Well, I did begin from there, so I, I can very easily answer that one. Um, I think the first step is what was my first step, and I can't imagine like being where I am now and, and attempting what I'm attempting now without having had like a music scene like this with open mics and like things that were really low pressure. You know, you're it, it's a, it's you just get up there and you play a song, and like. That for me was the gateway into, you know, stage. Because I grew up doing theater and I grew up being on stage. But you're playing a other, you're playing a part, and it's someone else's words and it's someone else's story. And there's you can give yourself over to that in a different way. Like when it's something you're writing, it's something you're like it's personal and it's real in a totally different way. And so even for me growing up being on stage, like I, the first couple times that I played an open mic. I was physically shaking. Like if I was physically shaking, I had no vocal control. Like I was so uncomfortable and so nervous and so like sick about it. And, um, thankfully, you know, I had you know, people who were there supporting me and who it was a very great sort of kind of room to play. And, but I was not at all comfortable with the notion, but there was still a part of me that wanted to do it. And it reached this sort of fever pitch where it was like worth the discomfort of getting up there because it's something I just wanted to do that badly. And, and it's going to be uncomfortable to start out and it takes time to just like mm -hmm. ease into, uh, being, being in front of people like that, doing your thing and putting yourself out there in that way. But I think open mics are great for that because it's, you know, you don't have to think about playing a whole, you just have to practice one song, like just get that one song to a place and you don't have to sing it perfectly. You don't have to, because people are there in those kinds of environments with a kind of understanding and, and there's a, there's a vibe about those spaces generally that's very forgiving and very like, yeah. So I think that's a great first step, just having a community that you can tap into that's really low pressure. And it's more about the community rather than, you know, the industry. It's just more about the community around music and art and everybody there feels the same, is in it for the same reasons, you know? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good answer, a, a fairly consistent answer with all the other unsigned guests yeah. too, is just um, to put yourself out there. So, um, tell us real quick, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Um, my website, 
Oh, hold on. Uh, the the audio is cutting out your voice. Go ahead. Yeah, how's, what's the best no, way for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, kellyhuntmusic.com, just one E in Kelly. Um, and then Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Um, and I'm active on, on all those platforms. And you can find me on YouTube, too. I'm starting to get the channel going there. That's probably the best way. Soon on Spotify, end of November, I'll be on Spotify and iTunes and all that. But you can find my album on my website. Okay, Kelly with one one e Kelly Hunt Music K E L L Y Hunt Music dot com. Uh, when you said one e, I was thinking K E E L L Y. I've never even no, heard of that or seen. Hunt, there's another Kelly Hunt musician in Kansas City. I'm Banjo Kelly Hunt here because there's another Kelly Hunt who have our names brought us together, and she's a wonderful woman. She's been in the scene for years. And I actually first heard about her when I lived in Memphis still because she'd come and play on the Memphis in May bill. She plays keys. She has a beautiful voice. But so I always have to distinguish. She spells her name K-E-L-L-E-Y. Uh, so yeah. me. And so I just have the one E and I'm Danjo Kelly. So I'm just used to making that distinction because um, if you do two E's, you'll find her website. If you do one E, you'll find mine. And you should definitely check both websites out. But yeah. And, and we shall. Well, we'll get the right URL in the show notes for this episode. So, um, Kelly, it has really, really been awesome talking to you. How do you, how do you feel about this episode? Great. No, I love this. this is fun. Okay. Yeah, I'm feeling good, too. So, for everybody listening, you can go to kellyhuntmusic.com, K-E-L-L-Y, huntmusic.com. You can go to unsigned.com, U-N-S-Y-N-D.com. You can find this episode, all the previous episodes, everything like that. Um, I think there's probably a way to... Yeah, you can get a podcast version of this, too, if you want to just listen to it. We're also on YouTube. Thanks, Anthony Slipic, for doing all of the booking and... Uh, now all of the, the posting too, which is a huge help for me. So I think, Kelly, we're going to stick a fork in it and leave it there. Um, yeah, I just I feel like we could have we could have gone forever. But anyway, hey, this has been All Free. Uh, that is Kelly Hunt. We're going to say tune out. Ooh.